Welcome, my friends, to Impact Discipleship. I like that. We're here. And you know where here is? Here is that we're arriving finally. I think it's been six months between the teaching of James and all the, the intercessions of other teachers and programs we've been doing here at Impact Discipleship. It's been probably close to six months, but this is the 13th teaching. 13th week that we've been in James, and today we bring it to a conclusion in a message called Effective Fervent Prayer. Now, that might seem like, well, that's, that's a no-brainer. We could easily name a study, Effective Fervent Prayer, that contains, uh, you know, that verse, that famous verse. But I think it's more, there's more to it than, than just understanding Effective Fervent Prayer. So if we would pop our Bibles open or your devices, I know I don't usually like to say that, but you know, I think you guys should know where, where these things are. And or we're gonna have a set of notes that are going around. If you're following online and you've downloaded the notes, <clears throat> you could follow along in the notes. We'll be going through those notes. I might reference those notes here and there, what page we're on, but we'll get somebody. How about you, young man? Since you did such a great job introducing us, why don't we read James chapter 5 verses 13 to 18 and then then at the end we'll just do uh, we'll just do 19 and 20 right here is anyone among you suffering let him pray is anyone cheerful let him sing psalms is anyone among you sick let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Thanks. So that's James uh, 5, 13 to 18. If, we, if, uh, if the first century writers had access to a computer or, or some kind of word processing system that had arrows and drop downs, you know, like, oh, topic, arrow, drop down, multiple topics. This, this handful of verses would have a gazillion drop downs, right? Because we could read it, and, 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 and of course the Bible, in, and within these words, it's contained unto itself, right? It, it, it has meaning. But when you hit the drop down, so many more things happen. And so, as we approach these, these verses, you, you can see the main theme here the main theme at the very end of the book, and let's just say he's closing his letter, this might, might as well be the exclamation point, or the period. You know, it's, it's, it's a final punctuation on everything that he said thus far. The themes are suffering, sickness, prayer. Like, that's, that's what he's talking about, see, seemingly. And, and what those mean is very important. Uh, and, and maybe they don't, necessarily mean only what we think they mean, right? So as we approach even just the 13th verse, we see um, James says, if anyone is suffering, let him pray. If anyone is cheerful, let him sing psalms. And, and, and we have to identify suffering first, right? And, and to not, to risk seeming gloomy Suffering is part of living. Mm -hmm. now, now, why is that the case? Focus in here. If you're like a, if you struggle with suffering, and I don't mean you suffer, meaning you don't like to suffer, right? Suffering is part of living. Why is suffering part of living? It's very simple. Because creation continues to exist in chaos, right? The further we get from Adam and Adam's sin, the more creation suffers. Now, for Christians, this might, you might be thinking, this is, 
this doesn't make sense because we have Christ interjected himself into creation, in a sense, you know, 2,000 years ago, right? But it's not the blood of Yeshua. It's not that the blood of Yeshua, you know, couldn't accomplish what it was supposed to accomplish. It's just simply that the blood wasn't supposed to fix the pointless disorder of creation. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the purpose of the blood. So the blood did what it was supposed to do, but it wasn't for, supposed to fix creation. The fixing of creation is your job. It's your job, right? So of course, um, let's let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and read Romans eight. If you're going to pass this on, if you want to. We're going to go ahead and read Romans 8, 18 to 22. Where, um, let me just preface this to say that you, those of you who have heard me teach from Romans 8 prophetically, we're not going there today. This is not a prophetic. We're not going to go into the depth here. I'll reference it a teeny bit, but that's not where we are. But can you just read 18 to 22, please? Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected, subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Okay. Can you see, can, you know, I hope you catch the reference to creation, right? So you could see Paul's words leading back to creation and Adam and why creation is living in its futility of destruction, its chaos, not because of its own cause, but because of Adam, Adam's sin. Let me, let me rephrase that. Man's sin brought creation into chaos. And at the writing of this first century letter, some maybe 30 odd years after the shed blood of Christ and the resurrection. Paul is telling us that this suffering at the present time, which is existing until now, those final words, um, is related to this corrupt creation, which is living in futility, existing inside of futility until something happens, right? And again, these deep prophetic concepts, I would just say if you haven't learned or sat under the, some of the deep prophetic concepts that we teach at KEM, in the notes, click on KEM website and just type in Romans 8, 18 to 22 into the search engine. And you'll get a dozen teachings that pop up to give you some deep prophetic meaning about the timing of this. Could we say this at least, if I were to bullet point this, so you could digest a little teeny bit of food, solid food, Number one, takeaway. Suffering is inevi inevitable in the broken universe we're in. That's number one. Number two, creation is broken because of what man did. Number three, because man did it, he has to fix it. Number four, when mankind finally becomes what God intends, because of the shed blood of Christ, meaning that part is done, then creation can be restored. And number five, the final transformation of mankind, that it says in this section, the glory of God revealed in us, that's what it looks like, is called the revealing of the sons of God. Again, not for the prophetic piece, but just know that when, when, when James says, is anybody is suffering, he's saying everyone is suffering. Humans are suffering. They're suffering because creation is corrupt. They're suffering because it's broken, right? What do you do because this exists? You can write this down, one four letter word. Pray, pray. For now, the approach to suffering is pray. That's, what, that's, the, that's the remedy for suffering. Now, we're going to, you know, like at the beginning I said these drop downs, 
we're going to click on some of these drop downs today. We're going to say, what are you praying for? What does the suffering look like? What really is the root of the suffering inside of mankind, right? But he also gives the contrast. He says, by the way, if they're suffering, pray. But if they're, if they're cheerful, sing a song, right? Because, because I, again, remember I said, I don't want to sound so gloomy that you don't get, because life is not only suffering, right? There are many, 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 many things to celebrate and for which to give thanks. The scriptures teach this. This is the verse that popped into my head. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Right? So I thought to myself, if you're going to sing a song because you're cheerful in opposition to pray for the suffering, uh, by the way, you know where that comes from? That comes from Nehemiah. Nehemiah 8, 9, and 10. This is what it says. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Now, now, by the way, let's just say they're crying happy tears. Why? Then he said to them, Go your way, eat, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared for this day is holy to the Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you know what happened? The word or the law of God, the word of God, the law of God, was restored in the hearing of the people after 70 years of exile in Babylon. The Persians have defeated Babylon. And, and the king's like, yeah, go ahead, go rebuild the wall and this and that. And they find the Torah scrolls. And they're like, we should read these to the people. And, and you get the first public reading of Torah scrolls in, in, in what we might think is around 70 years. And the people are, are joyful. They're crying with tears. And, and, you know, so it's like we could almost think like for us, if you could see, you know, the quintessential worshiper David who gave thanks songs in both times of suffering and times of victory. Right? Like he understood the joy of the Lord is my, my strength. He understood it. He understood that idea, right? And I, I like to insert this idea also, if you're following along in the notes, it's towards the bottom of page four, this concept of empathy. Because in, in Romans 12, 15, Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It's a very, very important concept of connecting with what's on the heart of people, right? Connect with people at their point of need. Be sensitive to what is happening in their lives. A life of faith is always, I want to write that down, always an others-focused life. Yes. Part of being others-focused is connecting to what they're experiencing, right? Now, Paul was a master empath. Oh, can I say that? That's almost like a Star Trek phrase, <laughs> right? A master empath. Not with hypocrisy, not with flattery, right? He mastered, what does it say? Becoming all things to all people. Why? It simply meant he knew how to connect with people, to enter their world, to ensure them that he understood their needs, their pains, their desires, their outlook, their worldview. He did not become their sin or dysfunction, but he did powerfully connect with them on a heart level so they believed that he understood their sin and dysfunction. See, he wasn't becoming a hooker to a hooker. He wasn't becoming a Greek to a Greek, like, oh, let me just be a, you know, a pantheist. Then I'm going to go worship all sorts of gods. He just understood how the Greeks thought. He understood what the sinner was experiencing so he could connect. L let me have somebody read. On the, hey, by the way, if you're in our notes, this is now kind of like right at the top, a few lines down on page five. Read 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 22. You can see how he writes that. About all things to all men. For though I am free from all men, I have made a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became a, as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law 
as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I become as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. You know, I like... <laughs> Nobody should like the way Paul writes, right? I mean, Paul's complicated. He's, he's, he's complicated and... If you read the Bible like you're reading, a, you know, some novel to entertain yourself, you're going to mix, you're going to miss stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And you always have to be thinking, sometimes you have to be thinking, what can't he mean? He can't mean become anything you need to be to satisfy someone so you can connect with them. He can't, can't mean that, right? Because mm -hmm. he would never tell you it's a good idea to become something that's an abomination to God, so you can connect to those being an abomination to God. He's not, he's not saying that. And, but what he, is, what he is saying, especially in this section about the law, there, there's a couple of types of people in existence in the first century, right? There's those that have no connection at all to God's commandments. Zero. They were raised pagans. They don't know from Torah. They know nothing. Then there's people that know Torah but have turned it into a legalistic mess that we call under the law. By the way, if I have to, I could connect to those people as a Jew by, because I know what they're thinking. They, they, they have the, the law as a list of rules and regulations that they think defines who they are. As opposed to those that have been enlightened that really the heart of the matter, the heart of the law has so many deeper layers and that's only able to be discerned through Christ. There's those people. I can mix with any of them. I understand what they're all thinking. And for that reason, I could, I could empathize with who they, what they think, what their struggles are, and how to touch their lives because I can connect to them. Right? That's what empathy is. So that, that's what he's saying. And, and, and it connects back to the flexibility of suffer with those who suffer and, and, and sing with those who are singing, right? Don't just be a gloomy person because, you know, oh, you know, like there's suffering in the world and every time I see you, all you're doing is moaning and whining. And no, there's plenty of reasons to have joy in life, even in the midst of suffering, right? So, so that's all our first verse, oh, me. verse 13. Verses 14 and 15 in James chapter 5, now, this is where it's going to get really deep, and, and I think revelatory for us as we approach our own lives and ministry to others. It says this, If any among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church that they may pray for him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Wow. That last phrase is the secret. That last, you know, part B of verse 15. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So let's, let's question this idea of, of sickness and, and why the elders. You know, who are the elders? Mature leaders who have borne out a testimony of faith over time. Right? They're not novices. Right? They don't blow in the wind. They're not carried away by every whim and desire. They're not deceived by every brand of doctrine. They are steadfast and dependable, tried and true. When you need a miracle, call an elder. Don't get somebody wavering in the wind and panicking over every little thing that goes on in the faith. Right? Somebody that has a long track record, consistent and solid. By the way, if you need counsel, that's who you go to. You don't go to your contemporary buddy, as to say to my boys when they were growing up, and their friends. If you want to do something so stupid, equivalent of tying yourself down on a railroad track, look at the friend. Don't tie yourself down with him. Cut the straps and pull him off the railroad track, right? Unfortunately, contemporaries tend to want to get on the railroad tracks together, right? You don't see counsel. Who are you seeking counsel on that relationship? My buddy. You mean the one with the bad relationship? It's probably a bad idea. You shouldn't do that. Seek an elder. Seek somebody that's got a track record, right? Why the anoint with oil? You know, James, James 
connects deeply with his Judaism, right? Of course he's a Jew in the first century, but he starts this whole letter out talking about the tribes and dispersion. Like, he's not apologizing for his Judaism. He's connecting his faith as a Christian with his Judaism, right? So when he says anoint with oil, that should be no surprise. It's very consistent with anointing oil from the Old Testament, right? Exodus 30, 22 to 23 gives you instructions on making anointing oil, right? And the primary purpose was to have an outward designation of setting something or someone apart for the Lord. Mm. And by the way, if you're sick, you want to be set apart for the Lord, right? Quarantined. Right? Doesn't that make sense? Not even, no, not quarantined. Holy. Made holy. Made, made, made healed. Mm -hmm. Holy ground, right? So you could, you know, and you could see in Exodus 30 and verse 29, it says, consecrate them with oil. That was originally... It was for the priests and the, and, the, and, the, and the items of the tabernacle. But it use is later extended, as you can see in 1 Samuel chapter 10, in verse 1, that Samuel took that anointed oil and anointed the first king of Israel with it. Of course, Saul being the first. <laughs> it didn't work, by the way. It was, well, it was made king, but it, was, it didn't work out, right? A little while. The other thing this area of Scripture says, if you go back to James... After the anointing oil, it says, in the name of the Lord. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that you enter every, you, you have to, you have to conclude every food prayer in the name of Jesus. You know, like, we get it, right? But what, what does it actually mean in the name of the Lord? The key point is, you do not think at any moment in time that anything miraculous you are capable of doing happens because of you. Right. Like, as soon as you think, you know, Simon the Sorcerer, let me have some of that power. I could turn it into some cash. Like, as soon as you, as soon as you start thinking it's about you, you've missed, you've missed the boat, okay? Let's just be real. With, with, without Christ, you're nothing. Absolutely. With Christ, you're everything. Absolutely. With Christ, you're not nothing. Right, equally as important, mm -hmm. right? So his name is his authority. Every, James earlier taught us in the first chapter, first part of his letter, everything good comes from the Father of Heaven, comes from access to the Father of Heaven, right? James 1.17. It all comes from the Father of Lights, all of it, right? Later on in the Gospels, um, or during the Gospels, in the later parts of, uh, of um, the Gospel of John, in John 14, 13, and 14, Yeshua, when he's teaching in the upper room, says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do for you, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name. So what is he saying? It doesn't mean, okay, so the acknowledgement is this. Let's pretend... Let's pretend for the moment you really are a true born-again Christian, which means your entire life is being animated by the Holy Spirit, which came through your born-again experience with Christ. Every prayer that seeps out of your mouth has its authority in that. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Even if you don't say, in the name of Jesus, at the end, in the name of Yeshua, at the end, right? I've been doing it a lot. It's not, you can do it, there's nothing wrong with doing it, but you, your prayer has no authority if you're not born again. And you're born again because you got born again through the name of, of Christ. So your prayer as a Christian is always coming through the name of Christ. Always. But, but it's a concept that we need to know because what it's really saying is your prayers only reach the throne room of heaven because of Yeshua. That's the only reason they get there. In His authority. They're only answered in His authority. Right? It says in John, 1 John 3.23, and this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave commandment, right? You can't tap any miracle outside of this line of prayer. It doesn't work. Right? So, so we have this idea of, 
um, the name and the authority, right? And then, it, then he says in James, and the prayer of faith that you pray, it'll produce something. Now, remember the context. Hey, if somebody's sick, bring an elder. Bring somebody steadfast, somebody that is rock solid. Pray in the authority of, of Christ because you have faith in the name of Christ. You know, without faith, nothing operates, right? Faith is the juice of the Christian life, right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? You know where that comes from? Hebrews chapter 11, 6. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is. Not just that he's a rewarder. He is. He is who? He is the Christ. He is Yeshua the Messiah. It is through his name and his authority and his will that all things exist. And what will the outcome be? You will save, here's the phrase, save the sick. What's the assignment? Save the sick. The question then remains, what is sickness? Right? Now, I want to refer you, if we're in the notes, if we could pass on the notes, if you're, you want to follow in the notes, it'd be easier to do this. We're going to go to the top of page 8, whoever's next reading. Gosh. Top of page 8. <laughs> I want to, see, I want to sh show you, connect to what they were sent out to do and what the message was and how this relates to save the sick. Right? Go ahead, read, read, read through those verses all the way down to Luke 10, 9. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease, Matthew 10, 1. And he called the 12 to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits, Mark 6, 7. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the, ki preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, Luke 9, 1 through 2. And heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you, Luke 10, 9. Okay, you see, you see, the, you see the pattern? Go out, cast out unclean spirits and demons, heal the sick, preach the kingdom. You see this? You see this pattern, right? Demons, sickness, kingdom. Why? If there's nothing else you take away from here today, take away this next line. Sickness is sin. Yep. Sickness is sin. You can clearly see this is, you have to connect this. I want you to connect the dots. The kingdom is a message of repentance and recognition of who the true Christ is. And forgiveness of sins is the mechanism of healing. If we could turn to the bottom of page 8, and let's, re let's read the narrative. Katie, since you're... Oh, who's next? Josh, you're right next door? Okay, good. Josh, the bottom of page 8, I want you to read where it, is, it begins. We're going to read a narrative from Mark 2, the first 12 verses. And I want, you to, I want you to see the mechanism here, the precedent. We'll call this a legal precedent. Go ahead, Josh. And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And some of, sons, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man seek blasphemies like this, who can forgive sins but God alone? 
But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they were all, all so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Okay. I hope this next thing I'm gonna tell you puts a piece together maybe that you've never seen before and excites you about what James is saying. A couple of phrases in that narrative that Joshua just read, famous narrative of breaking the roof open and lowering the paralytic through, and instead of him saying, uh, your, paral your paralysis is healed, he just said, your sins are forgiven. And the question on the minds of the scholars was, who can, f who can forgive sins but God? And Yeshua says, to show you that I have the power to forgive sins, I'm going to heal because the sickness is related to sin. You get it? So the power to forgive sins was questioned because they said only God has the power to forgive sins. Or in other words, the power of prayer to pray the prayer of faith to save the sick because that's what James is telling us to do and when he had said this he breathed on them and said Yeshua breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven if you retain the sins they are retained who is he talking to Raise your hand. Say, me. So we have the power to forgive sins. Power to forgive sins, which is the way to heal the sick. Wow. That's why James is saying, okay. right? That's why James is saying. And by the way, when you look at the narrative of go out, go out and do this, heal the sick, cast out the demons, you see it, especially Luke. Luke is very kingdom-oriented. Luke uses the phrase the kingdom, right? Do you remember when, when, when at Yeshua's baptism, when John looked at Yeshua, he said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? He was saying, he turned towards Yeshua and pointed at him and said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means turn or turn back. That's what the word repent means, teshuva, in Hebrew means to turn back towards Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So when he is saying, repent, he's saying, turn to Yahweh, pointing at Christ, turn to Yahweh, the kingdom is at hand. That's in Matthew 3, 1 and 2. The next chapter after Yeshua comes out of the wilderness and he goes into public ministry, in chapter 4, verses 17, his first recorded words are, repent, Turn towards Yahweh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This time he's saying, look here, look right at me, right? So when you preach the kingdom, the only way to achieve kingdom is repentance. Why? Because when you point to Yahweh or towards Yahweh, you have to turn away from everything that's sin. Sin equals sickness, however it manifests. Demons, physical sickness, depression, discontent, you name it, right? And that is why the next verse, now watch how it makes sense. That's why the next verse says, confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. What is he saying? You can't be healed without repenting from your sin. And how do you repent? Confess one to another. Confess, and then pray for one another. How do you pray? The next verse. 
the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now you understand what he means about effective, fervent prayer? An elder comes or, or a brother comes and you pray and you're, 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 you're praying for the person who's confessed their sins. And because you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the power to forgive, forgive sins. What? Christians, the power to forgive sins, just according to the words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. But we talked about this last night in last night's sermon, right? Um, apostolic footprints. Because this verse came up about how you remedy problems, the effect of fervent prayer. It's like the troubleshooting of, you know, walking on rough terrain, right? The, the hard points of life, like how do you manage them? And of course, you know, effective and fervent, you know, you've got to be passionate. And if you want your prayers to work, what does it say? A righteous man. Mm. A righteous man, right? So if we got the confess part. That's the repentance part. You got the pray for one another part. That's the commission. Knowing that you have the power to forgive sins because if you forgive it, they're forgiven. Mm -hmm. But what about the righteous part? You see the twofold thing here? The person, the person being prayed for needs to confess their sins. The person doing the praying needs to be righteous. Amen. Because effective, fervent prayer comes from righteous lips. Righteousness, we talked about this last night multiple times. A man who seeks God first in all things, lives by faith, worships and gives thanks to God for everything and is dedicated to radical obedience. You see the formula? That's why it's not some just pray and everybody gets healed or force it or all these extraordinary like shows that they give. There's, a, there's pieces here that have to fit in place. And when you do that, it avails much. The type of prayer will produce what God desires. And it must be according to, it says, according to his will and authority, right? That's what it says, his will. Now, this is... The confidence that we have in him, that anything you ask in his will, no, no, will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we ask for. That's 1 John 5, 14. And then again, you guys brought up the name. Again, John 14, 13, and 14. Pray whatever you ask in his name. We know that is his authority, right? Mm -hmm. Very cool, right? Yes. Then James in his wonderful reflection on his Judaism and his background, he refers to Elijah. He says, Elijah, now why is he doing this? Because he's saying, you know how powerful prayer can be? He says, Elijah was a man like us, he had our nature. And look what he did, he prayed earnestly, earnestly, effective and fervent, mm -hmm. and for it not to rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. This is verse 17 and 18. And then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced fruit. Right? So, the inference here is very simple. Elijah wasn't special. He's just a man like you're a man. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Everything he did, listen to this. Let me give you the format. I, I'm not going to have you, listen, you can read, and you should. In the notes, I have like a little thing that says, read 1 Kings 17 and 18. You can see the narrative, the full narrative, and all the intricacies of what went on when he was praying for no rain and praying for rain. Right? You can see it. But I, I, I highlighted some verses, but even more so, I highlighted this. You know why he was not special? Because this is what you're going to see in the narrative. As the Lord of God of Israel lives before whom I stand. This was, this was his testimony when Elijah was praying. Before the Lord God of Israel who lives and before whom I stand. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. What is it telling you? Elijah wasn't doing this. This wasn't about Elijah. This was just about Elijah knowing what God was telling him to do. It wasn't Elijah. Here, here's, here's the excerpts from it. 1 Kings 17, 1 and 7. We're going to just read those two verses. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years except for by my word. By his word. Why? Because that's what God is telling him. He's saying, 
according to God. Verse 7, and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because it had not rained in the land. The man, ra the man prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Right? Then he prayed and it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. Elijah, I'm Yahweh. This is what you got to do. Go do this and rain will come. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. By the way, this is the next chapter, chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, 41 and 45 and 46. And verse 41, it says, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is sound of abundant rain. Now mind you, it hasn't rained in three and a half years when he said this. Now it happened in the meantime, the sky became black. This is verse 45 with clouds and wind, and there was heavy rain. So Ahab, Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he ran ahead to Ahab at the entrance of Jezreel. What is it saying? He wasn't doing this. He was a man like you. What was he doing? He was tapping into the will of Yahweh and only praying for what Yahweh wanted. You see it? Why James inserts that little narrative right into pray for the, the healing. I would like someone, whoever's next, to read on the on in our notes. We're almost done actually. I think it's a short study today. So who's got next? You're gonna be in the middle of page 13, and you're gonna read just the last two verses of James, where it says turn. Brethren, if any one among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and over a multitude of sins. James 5, 19 through 20. Now, doesn't that make perfect sense to you now? If we could call this the explanation point of the entire letter, here's the deal. Uh, wandering from the truth. Okay. Give me a three-letter word that means wandering from the truth. Sin. Sin, right? The final words of James should make so much sense now, right? It makes per perfect sense. What does it mean to wander from the truth? What is truth? Yeshua is truth. Yeshua is the word of God. The word of God is truth. When you wander from the truth, you are wandering away from Yeshua, right? You know Yeshua is the word of God, right? In John... John 1, first four verses, and verse 14, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that wasn't made, that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Any, any, any problems or clarity needed to realize when you wander from the truth, you're wandering from the Word, and the Word is Christ. Right? How about the Word being truth? This should sum it up. Psalm 119 and 160. Verse 160. The entirety of your Word is truth. Keegan knew that. He's got it memorized. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Right? So, we have Yeshua is the Word, we have the Word is truth, and then we have Yeshua is the truth. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father filled with sin, wandering from the truth. Right? Conclusion. Wandering away from the truth is wandering away from God's Word or wandering away from Yeshua. The three-letter word that defines this is sin. And sin equals sickness, which prayer, repentance, and forgiveness is needed for. That's why you have to pray for the sick. You have to pray for them to repent of their sin so they can be healed. Not just, oh, let me pray for you, brother. It's not me. I somehow have the power to heal your sins. When you see, when you can picture Yeshua healing someone, it's because he's discerning they're repentant. Mm -hmm. They can't be healed if they're not repentant. Mm -hmm. 
their faith healing. Yeah. Right? It goes on to say, it starts talking about turning sinners. What does the word turning refer to? What's the word in Hebrew? Repentance. 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 Turning a sinner or turning him back from the error, errors of his ways means you're leading someone into repentance. Teshuva. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. No repentance, no kingdom. Right? Outcome. It saves a soul. That's what it says in James. It saves a soul. How? Because it erases their sins. Repentance brings forgiveness, and forgiveness erases sins. Now, I mean, this is so important for Christians, erases sins. It doesn't just, it doesn't just, it doesn't just temporarily remove the burden of the sin. It erases the sin. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Psalm 103.12. As far as, as east is from west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I want you to notice this as we close. You can travel east infinitely and you will never be heading west. That is how far, that's how God views our past sins. The ones we have repented of and he has already forgiven. This is very different than traveling north. Those sins come back and haunt us because you can only travel so far north before you are again traveling south. That's why God removes your sins as far as east is from west, because east never meets west, but north does meet south. Is that because of the climate, or why, why is that? <laughs> no, that's because of the earth. Just go east. If I said go east and keep going oh, east, you will always be going east. Right. If I said go north, you will eventually be going south. Right, exactly, I get it. Right? right? So the admonition here is be an east-west Christian, not a north-south Christian. North-South Christians, they just go back and repeat their sin over and over again. See, repentance is about, repentance is about true, true turning back to Yahweh. Mm. That's how, that's how healing happens. Make sense? Praise God for that. Hey, listen, we have a couple weeks coming up where we have some guest teaching happen. Uh, I think Isaac is on tap for next week. Rabbi Isaac? And then, uh, then we have a testimony week coming. Uh, that we will record and post in a new section of our website coming, uh, a testimony section. But when, when I come back with you after that, we will be doing a le the letter to Titus, which is like a condensed, contracted, supercharged version of First and Second Timothy, all wrapped up in, in three chapters mm -hmm. and one book. The first one will be called The Elder's Task. We will see you next week. Praise God for that. Ooh.